Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Okay, bye-bye. So I'd, I'd like to set this video up for the audience. Uh, Dr. O'Toole talked a little bit about the medical history and uh, some of the demographics of this case uh, and background. This, is the, this was the first pilot case that we created at Cartini Clinic. And I was actually, as a pediatrician, I'm actually a pediatrician and a pediatric emergency physician as, by training. I am not an eating disorder specialist, uh, but I was there at the clinic and, we, and I actually interviewed this particular patient. And I think one of the advantages of, of creating a library of real patient videos is for educators and for students, it's an opportunity to learn what to do and, and what not to do. And I'm a humble uh, physician. I, 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 I've become more humble and uh, over time uh, because we all make mistakes. And clearly, I um, asked a few questions that in the eating disorders world maybe not would not have been appropriate uh, as an eating disorders specialist and maybe an opportunity for learning. Uh, Dr. O'Toole, could you talk a little bit about uh, or give me feedback in terms of my interview? And I know we have we actually have a therapist uh, from your clinic on, and I know we have some other social workers uh, who are here who maybe uh, uh, were cringing when they saw that video. And again, um, I take uh, ownership of it. This is the first uh, uh, video we shot at the at the Cartini Clinic. Dr. O'Toole, can you talk a little bit about what I did that maybe wasn't okay and, and how you approach talking about weight at, at your clinic? David, thank you for that. I, you know, I guess the basic principle is that we don't talk about weight with um, the child themselves past probably the initial interview. And I, I, as you know, and you've been such a great sport about it, my staff was standing behind you. And when you asked her how much she weighed, they, they were aghast. You know, those are like the forbidden words in an eating disorder clinic. The problem with asking the kids what they weigh, what they should weigh, or how much weight they've lost, is that they'll never hear another word you say. It's a little bit like that Gary Larson cartoon, what we say to dogs and what dogs hear. Mm -hmm. And it's if you say if you say a weight number, that will be all that they hear. That'll be the end of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So, but clearly, when you first interview a child, you have to get some sense of what's going on. How do you do that? Well, before I go in the room with the child, which I almost always do after I've interviewed the parents extensively, I know perfectly well what their peak weight was and what they wait now. Um, what I'm more interested in finding out are their, you might call them weight goals. So I do something called a rating of eating disorder severity interview, which, is, uh, which we call the REDS. The REDS interview um, is something that we choose to do instead of the usual EDE and other eating disorder assessments because it has a strong medical component, which I like as a pediatrician. But one of the really useful questions there is to try to tease out what the person, what the patient's, what the young person's weight goal is. And so I may say to them, although I'll never speak of it again, what is the most that you've ever weighed? And in her case, she'd say 250 pounds. And then it's important to be very neutral about that. Oh, you just say, okay, 250, you write it down. But you don't say, wow, whoa, <laughs> right, exactly. Even though, of course, mm -hmm. that's what you're feeling. You're only human, right? So you just say, ah, 250 pounds. Mm -hmm. So if I had a magic wand and I could make you any weight in the whole world, now they're expecting me to say, what do you want to weigh? But I blindside them by saying, what weight do you feel would be too low for you? And they're almost always taken aback and they're like, too low? And um, I say, yeah, yeah, too low. So, um, and they'll say something like, oh, if I weighed 100 pounds, in the case of this girl who formerly weighed 250, that would be too low. And then I say, okay, so if you weighed 100 pounds, you'd say, whoa, I've got to gain weight. And then usually they will say, oh, well, no, not really. Now answers will vary considerably from the most affected children who will say, eventually say in their own words, there literally is no weight so low 
that it would impel me to want to gain weight. Or they might say things like, oh, I guess if I weighed 60 pounds, I would want to gain weight. Now, part of the reason that I'm gathering this information is to help the parents understand the depth of the psychopathology. So when I then return and tell the parents what the kids said, which I always do, because we have family-based treatment and we do not keep secrets from parents, mm -hmm. um, the parents are usually startled and shocked to hear that their son or daughter would not be concerned about their weight unless it dropped below, pick some number, 60 pounds. Um, but I, I think it's important, it's really critical information. So I, I almost never ask, except perhaps in the oldest patient, for old for us would be 18, who has some good cognitive abilities and insight, what do you want to weigh? It's it's a point that would be a pointless exercise anyway. And usually they laugh and say, "Yeah, I want to weigh ninety. I know that's ridiculous." Mm -hmm. So you're using it as a springboard, really, to talk about things that matter more. I appreciate that. Uh, we we're very fortunate for those of you that joined us late. We're very fortunate to have Bruce Burke on with us, who is a uh, one of the most outstanding pediatricians in the Portland, uh, Oregon area, and a contributor to Real DX Education. Uh, uh, Bruce, uh, curious, uh, seeing this, this case a, as a primary care provider, when, when do you actually refer, what are the things that you look for in the, from a primary care pediatrician standpoint that m make you want to refer to, uh, an eating disorders clinic like the Cartini clinic? Well, the, the mantra of all primary care physicians of any sort, providers, it's, it's early detection and early treatment. So when to refer normally follows, you've, you've, you've identified risk factors, you're looking for them from a very young age, um, abnormal body image from a young age, uh, parental attitudes toward eating. We see two-year-olds whose parents are shoveling food into them in a way that makes us concerned. Uh, family history, of course, family history of mood disorder, family history of eating disorder. So we're looking for early detection. And then if we have a sense that we're moving, even from a very young age, we will think about early treatment. So I know it sounds, you know, if you're picturing that we're looking for the adolescent who is having an eating disorder, we're actually looking for the, child, the school age child who has abnormal eating patterns. So from a very young age, we'll refer to a dietitian we'll start thinking of a team approach uh, long before hopefully we hit actual pathology. Mm -hmm. We'll refer to a psychologist. We have a team of psychologists, modern medical community. We have a medical home. We have psychologists. We have dietitians. And we'll start to work with them, especially ones um, who are familiar and comfortable working with kids with uh, uh, abnormal eating patterns or a uh, history that suggests that they'll go on towards an eating disorder. And then if we think that there's a, certainly long before we hit medical instability, we think that it's time to refer to um, a place like the Cartini Clinic. Obviously, we grade uh, anorexia. There's, there's a mild and early eating disorder. There's, there's a, a middle ground and there's a high severity. Uh, so we absolutely refer when we think that they've passed a point of medical stability. When we have, um, we have the American Academy of Pediatrics has said, and the Cartini Clinic works with it, a, a very specific array of recommendations for when to admit a child who is medically unstable, and we follow those to the letter. Um, but we want to catch them early, as early as possible, and send them and work with them. And if we can't provide that kind of well-rounded dietitian, psychologist, and a primary care provider who can work with them, setting specific goals with uh, aggressive, consistent follow-up, then we'll refer to the Cartini Clinic as early as possible. Sure. And you talked about early detection. Uh, what tools do you use? It's interesting. I, I want to ask Julie very specifically because there are a bunch of labs uh, that uh, were recorded associated with this patient, including leptin, LH, FSH, and estradiol. Uh, Bruce, what, what tools do you use, uh, whether it's basic as a, a growth, growth chart uh, what 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 actual tools do you use for for early detection or labs or any of that that to to make you feel comfortable either making the diagnosis or referring to a specialist that makes the diagnosis of of eating disorder? 
Well, the, the growth chart certainly, um, their, their, uh, their, the, how they feel about their body, um, refusal to eat, um, body fat below a certain level, which we can measure heart rate. You can measure certainly let heart rates below 50 become very concerning for us. Uh, blood pressure, uh, we, um, we, we do a weight in a specific manner. We do a weight uh, with them wearing a gown after they have uh, uh, peed. Um, physical exam findings can be very helpful uh, besides the vital signs, certainly, um, as she mentioned, looking for uh, classic physical signs of wasting are helpful. Um, and then with labs, uh, that those do come into play. They don't come to play as much. Certainly, uh, potassium concentration, uh, chloride, your basic uh, comp metabolic panel can be very helpful. Um, an EKG, of course, can be helpful. Um, and these kind of fall along with the basic criteria for when you're thinking of admitting a child. Um, we're hopefully, you know, these are the things that we're looking for when we've lost medical stability. The idea, though, is to detect and treat much earlier than that point and refer to the Cartini Clinic long before we get to those measures. That's a great uh, point, actually. For, for many of the folks in our audience, we have some educators who will be teaching eating disorders. Um, Julie, from your perspective, when, what, what is the line that you cross when you decide to admit a patient with an eating disorder? When, when does the patient go from medically stable to medically unstable, what labs, what vital signs do you use to uh, make that call for admission? Because I know you and your colleagues at the Cartini Clinic do follow patients and attend uh, in the inpatient environment. Could you, could you go through the general criteria that you use for when you admit a child? I could, David, and I will, but let me just address a couple of things first that Bruce said that are really critical to uh, listening providers, and that is the growth chart. Way more important than the labs um, is the growth chart, provided mm -hmm. that you don't misinterpret it. And this particular patient would be a good example of how it would be easy to be tripped up. Weight loss in childhood is not normal, and you have to hold on to that concept because even though it isn't desirable for a 15-year-old girl to weigh 250 pounds, it's not a good trade-off for her to weigh 90. In fact, she's much more endangered at 90 than she was at 250. Um, and so what matters is crossing percentiles in a downward direction. Do not be falsely consoled by the fact that the child is still, quote, on the growth chart. I've had several parents come to me whose pediatricians did not recognize the severity of the child's illness because the child was still on the 50th percentile, hmm. never mind that she'd started off on the 95th. So it's the, the most powerful tool that you have is actually the growth chart, but you have to be aware uh, that what you're looking for is a downward trend. So I think it's always worth uh, doing what Bruce described, which is when you identify concerning behaviors, and you're not quite sure what you're looking at, and you want to head this off at the pass, to refer to a dietitian, a therapist, but whomever you refer to, and bring the parents in, of course, so that they can learn how to feed their child better, you need to have closest follow-up. Never say, I'll see you again in a month. Hmm. Say, I'll see you next week, and then I'll see you the week after that, I'll see you the week after that. Because if they cannot regain lost weight, never even mind continue to lose weight. They need, in my opinion, a referral. So when I get asked by medical students, when should I refer? I tell them that as far as I'm concerned, true anorexia nervosa is a brain disorder. Furthermore, it is a malignant brain disorder. So I say, when you are working a patient up for anemia, and you look at their blood count and you see a blast, when do you refer? So now I'll get, now I actually answer your real question, which was how do we decide who's medically unstable? Mm -hmm. That's much, much simpler. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics has guidelines for physicians and other practitioners who treat children with eating disorders. And they're published on our website. They're published, um, in position papers from the academy, but 
most salient features are a heart rate below 50, importantly, regardless of athletic status. Do not be fooled by the child who's a runner and has a heart rate of 41, that this somehow represents high training or good health. These are children, not professional athletes. And in the face of undernutrition, starvation, and weight loss, this bradycardia takes on a whole different dimension. You can tell that it's uh, abnormal, by the way, because it always resolves, even in elite athletes, athletes, and we've had um, a number of elite athletes over the years, it always resolves with better nutrition. So it resolves so, uh, into the 60s, high 50s? Well, above 50 is what we're looking for mm -hmm. to get them out mm -hmm. of the hospital. Mm -hmm. Low 50 usually wins them admission to the hospital. That's shifted a little bit for us in particular because we have a very strong partial hospital program where we can accept a little bit of medical instability but in general if you don't have if that's not what you have available to you you're much better off adhering um, really religiously to the academy guidelines another one uh, are, are orthostatic pulse and blood pressure changes which I conceptualize really as physical compromise ending in the heart, um, having difficulty pumping blood uphill. So essentially when you stand up, in a healthy person, you, you get a positive inotropic response, you know, where you get the heart essentially beats stronger. When it can't, because it's weakened by, new, by malnutrition, it beats faster to try to make up the same stroke volume, right? Mm -hmm. And so you see this spike in the heart rate. Yeah, in the emergency room, they use a change from lying to standing of greater than 20 to define orthostasis. We set the bar a little bit higher. We say 35. Um, but it, it, the important thing is, by the you're deep into the weeds by the time the child is medically compromised to this degree. What you're more likely to see is is weight loss, mm -hmm. and that's really what you should be looking for. And then just real quickly, because uh, we, we only have five minutes left in the webinar, could you just review some of the biochemical markers, Julie, that you use? I noticed that you, you checked a leptin level. Um, I'm wondering if this is some, what, the meaning, what the meanings behind these levels are and, and how you interpret them. <laughs> well, David, that's a very interesting question and a complex one. But uh, a few years ago, I was complaining to a colleague of mine in Seattle, who is a metabolic expert, Dr. Emily Cooper, that we appeared to have this cohort of kids who, despite clear weight restoration, did not achieve resumption of menses. I see. And I couldn't figure out why. And you couldn't, in good conscience, continue to push their weight. And she said, oh, well, I know why. It's because their leptin is remaining suppressed. Like most physicians, I sort of had this vague idea of what leptin was. We began checking leptins, and it, we saw what you're seeing in this patient, these incredibly low leptins of uh, less than 0.4. And a patient like this, a normal leptin would be 10, 11, 12, something like that. Uh, it was very, uh, very interesting. And so as we followed this out, the majority of patients, you refeed them back to a good body weight for them. You'll just see the leptin tracking along nicely, and then it crosses whatever threshold that represents their own individual biology, and they have resumption of menses, and they go off uh, able to exercise and do things. But we learned, we have learned both from Dr. Cooper and from our own experience, that leptin can be suppressed by continued restricting. Mm -hmm exercise, unfortunately, and hypoglycemia. And that there appear to be a cohort of kids who, in the process of refeeding and reestablishing weight, go through periods of postprandial hypoglycemia. We had to convince ourselves. Dr. Cooper warned us this would be the case. We've done you know, many, many glucose tolerance tests, modified glucose tolerance tests, where we uh, have the kids eat a meal, and then we do 30, 60, 90 glucose and insulin. And we see profound hypoglycemia, profound, 30, 35, 50, you know. Uh, and, 
and consequent suppressed leptin. So we are just really beginning to explore this at the Cartina Clinic. It's a bit outside the realm of what you'd be doing in the general um, physician's office, but it, it's, it, it kind of belongs in that category of good to know. The problem with a low leptin, David, is that it will suppress LH. Sure. And so LH will suppress menstruation. So we have a question from uh, someone, uh, two, two folks in the audience. Uh, one is from uh, Dr. Bobby Lazara. Are there fundamental advice that should be given to parents regarding body image concerns in young girls? Um, Julie, I know we have Nachma from your clinic. Uh, do either of you want to tackle that question uh, in terms of advice that you'd be giving to the parents? Let's say, let's say, let's say uh, th this child were, were being intaked into your clinic. Um, how do you prepare the parents for what's to come in terms of the treatment that I assume will take months, if not years, to be working with your, your group? I think those might be two separate questions, David. Um, I, I think um, that the question was about what to tell parents to help them with body image struggles that the child might be having. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that's what, what, with a, a bit Let's of an, okay, with a bit of an implication that I, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Dr. Lazara, that perhaps a person could head off further eating disorder or an eating disorder um, by what you said or what you did. I uh, wish that were true. I don't think that it is true though. I think, I, I think it would be like trying to head off autism or schizophrenia by something that you said. Um, secondary prevention, which is basically early recognition, is about the only tool we have because we don't know what causes anorexia nervosa. And it's very, in my view, very unlikely to be anything you said or did. Sort of an indirect line of evidence for this are the about six patients I've had of Munchausen by proxy, where the parent actually tried to give the child an eating disorder. They weren't successful. You can't give someone schizophrenia or give someone autism, and you can't actually give them this. Um, that's the good news and the bad news. I think uh, though in terms of helping a family and helping a child cope with their feelings, it is important to de-emphasize size and weight in the home. That's really uh, a profound and I'm imagining it's, it's, it's uh, also difficult in practice to do what you just said. Um, we're going to be wrapping up soon in the next minute or two. I encourage, I just sent a chat to everyone. Um, Bobby and Bob had uh, made some comments. If anyone has any questions for uh, Dr. Burke or uh, uh, Dr. O'Toole, please uh, throw in a quick comment or chat. Uh, Bob McCullen from AT Still is a primary care PA uh, and mentioned that he's trying to figure out how to include this case in case studies. Uh, Julie, if you were to give, or Bruce, if Julie, if you were to give, if you were putting on your hat and you were teaching first year uh, medical students, PA students, nurse practitioner students, we have some faculty from Columbia, uh, welcome colleagues, uh, Columbia Nurse Practitioner School. If you were to use this case in a teaching modality, what would be the um, what would be the one or two take home teaching points you'd want to drive home to students who are about to become clinicians and and healthcare professionals in regard to uh, presenting this case? Well, this case in particular brings up a lot of important points, David. But number one, I think would be that you can die of anorexia nervosa at every weight. And that the most endangered patient is the one who was pre-morbidly obese because their weight loss will be seen as a positive. That is probably the most important take-home message from this child. I think in general, the most important take-home message in the treatment of anorexia nervosa is that without weight restoration, you get nothing. 
You yeah. will not get psychological recovery. Very true. Yeah. Uh, and that is, um, that's something that has improved over the last 10 years, but it, uh, you still see patients entering treatment programs uh, and leaving at a weight that is either no higher or even lower than when they came in because people falsely believe that you have to buy in to your treatment in order for it to work. It's just simply not true. This is a medical condition and uh, you, can, you, you can't improve the health of the child if you do not restore their weight. That, that's such an important point that you made. And um, honestly, I've been practicing for all these years. I'm a pediatric ER physician. And I actually never knew that a patient like this who had uh, gone from obesity to uh, this point uh, was at higher risk than, than uh, a child that develops anorexia nervosa from a, from, a, from a baseline normal weight or whatever the weight, the ideal body weight of that child is. Uh, so that is interesting, which also makes me think that asking her about her previous weight was, uh, was <laughs> not a great thing to do. Uh, so again, <laughs> I'm a humble guy and willing to take ownership of it, but it's obviously an amazing uh, teaching point, which we brought out uh, so everyone can see. We did bring it out in the editor's note uh, that, that it was uh, not a cool thing to do. Um, and I just wanted to mention, uh, Bruce, did you have any comments or knock my, you, you have a history of being a former chief resident. If you were in front of a medical student, is there any, any other than what Julie mentioned, any other a teaching point that you'd want to make as an educator uh, around this particular case? I think yeah. her emphasis on the idea that uh, any weight loss in childhood is to be considered to a large degree abnormal, should be monitored closely, and especially a child who is going from obese to emphasize weight instead of lifestyle, instead of healthy living choices, and, and to, to moderate and without uh, without pause is is a risky behavior for a provider. Now, Claude, did I, you go ahead? Yeah, I would add, I would also add an addition. Uh, hi, this is Nakhla Moshtal. I'm Julio Tool's partner. Um, so I would add really history taking, right? I joined you folks in the middle of this webinar, but I would add really history taking and particularly talking to the child and the family about what does a child eat? I think that when I joined the Cartini Clinic, even though uh, the pediatric faculty had taught me to get really history during the well child checkups, I don't think that I really learned how to take a nutrition history until I started working at the Cartini Clinic. You know, taking time for five to 10 minutes to really listen to what the child actually eats, not what they would like to eat, but what they actually eat and to just take a history of it. And you know, the second point that Julie really talked about, which is when you are concerned about a child's well-being, particularly about abnormal weight loss, this business of saying, I will see you in two months, I will see you in three months, that is not okay. Uh, the answer should be, I'll see you in a week. And if we are in a busy pediatric or family medicine practice, then a nurse's appointment should be okay. That's what I teach the pediatric residents every, you know, every week. If you're busy, it's perfectly okay to say, hey, I'll make you a nurse's visit to get a vital signs check, and I, I wanna know more about you. I wanna hear more about your story, because I'm just getting to know you a little bit more. And when in doubt, we refer patients. We refer them to cardiologists, to pediatric hematologists, et cetera, et cetera. Why would we hesitate referring patients who have eating disorders? So, um, and the best way of introducing this is I'm, concerns about, I'm concerned about your growth and your nutrition, and I would like to have specialists take a look at you. I don't know if you have an eating disorder, but I would like for them to evaluate your growth and your nutrition. So those would be, you know, the pearls that, would, that I would share with medical students or nurse practitioners or PAs. So in your opinion, do you think uh, in general, there are various forms of eating disorders which we can get at another time and we're gonna to have to end in the next minute or two. Um, 
Do you think it's an under-recognized condition in, in our communities? I think we're doing a better job uh, because, you know, I think we're doing a better job at educating uh, providers. But I also think that a lot of times, thanks to what is labeled as the epidemic of obesity, we talk so much about weight loss that we are not really recognizing about really what, you know, we're not really talking about the essence of what is, you know, at the bottom of some of the illnesses that we're talking about. We're not really talking about what is at the bottom of hypertension or obesity. We're going after obesity completely in a different way. And I think that that should be a topic for a different webinar, David. It will be, it will be at some point. <laughs> one, one quick last question um, from Sasha. She said she found that uh, parents often have significant difficulty managing and monitoring the excessive exercise that tends to increase while at while restoration is attempt, is a, attempted. Any thoughts, Julie or Nachma, do you want to try to address that? Oh, David, Sasha just put her finger on what is without doubt the most difficult to manage component of childhood anorexia. It's difficult for a couple of reasons. Uh, uh, some cases will have a very, very severe exercise component. And I mean uh, relentless exercise when they, they can't sit down they refuse to sit they stand all the time they um, jump up and down they behave inappropriately in a public setting and this is only partially under conscious control they may jiggle and wiggle their legs they may uh, they may find it impossible to lie down this is uh, this only time sometimes the use of uh, neuroleptics will calm, and, and of course, refeeding, will calm this down. But actually one of the biggest issues for the more garden variety um, over exercise that we see is that the parents really struggle saying no to a child who has formerly been viewed by them as an athlete. And since I've said it before in my writings, exercise is the sacred cow of American life, Mm -hmm. not criticize it or you criticize it at your peril it's very difficult for parents who've gotten this constant message that exercise will ward off Alzheimer's and increase longevity and is good for you morally etc very difficult for them to draw the line with the child who needs to stop exercising for a significant period of time maybe even a year well I would like to um thank our uh, panelists, most importantly. I, um, it's a real honor, uh, uh, Julia and Nachma, as I've learned from working with you all uh, in this role of uh, understanding more about eating disorders, uh, both in a nice way and, and a little bit painfully after creating this uh, video, uh, getting all the, all the interesting comments around it. It's really an honor and to, to see all the great work that you do. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just incredibly imp uh, thankful that you're willing to share some of the work that you're doing. I think that this is going to be very helpful for primary care physicians. It's going to be very helpful for educators and for the students and, and potentially for patients ultimately. So thank you very much. I want to thank Dr. Bruce Burke for joining us uh, um, um, as a pediatrician and, and a contributor to Real DX. Thank I'd you. like to thank our, uh, our, our viewers as well for joining us today. Uh, we will be having webinars every two weeks, twice a month. Our next webinar will be January 22nd. We'll be uh, publicizing that on the realdx.com website. Thank you very, very much, everyone, for joining us, and hope you all have Thank a great you, rest of the day. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, David. Thanks, Thanks David. David. Okay, bye-bye.